Okay, let's open up the meeting then. Um, first thing will be to approve the minutes from last meeting. I would move to approve the minutes from the last meeting. I'll second the second the motion to appeal the minutes from January 4th. And any any questions from anyone? Any all set? Okay. All in favor? Mary votes yay. I vote yay. No oh, yes. I'm gonna hear from you, Martha. Um, yes, okay. I say yay. Aye. Aye. Good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And the minutes are approved. Um, then, uh, before we get on to other things, let's um, okay the, the uh, warrants uh, for this this month, this two week period. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but uh, someone could yeah, so do, do I. You want to make a motion, Phil, and then we'll. Uh, I make a motion to accept the uh, accounts payable up to January 19th, 2021. Curtis, oh. I'll second. Okay. 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 So. All right, so we have a little discussion before we vote on that. Uh, here, have some things. Uh, Dave, um, there's an odd one here from Northern Nurseries for looks like 50 pounds of salt grounds upkeep for $500, $534. What is that? So we got away from using just the regular rock salt, uh, uh, particularly on the front steps of Damon Hall and over at the rec center. Uh, as well as in the side steps, because the, the rock salt was kind of a part of the problem that is why we had to redo the, the steps there. So yeah. we're using a, a friendlier salt, so to speak. Uh, and that's what that purchase was. It must be more than 50 pounds. That's a strange. Maybe it comes in 50 pound bags. So it didn't basically, it, so we purchased basically, looks like 10, 10 units. Okay. Uh, and, and each unit looks like it's 50 pounds. It says 49, so it's 50 pounds bag or or box or whatever it is and we purchased 10 of them okay thanks for that um <clears throat> the truck service from reed's truck you know that must have to do with the truck that got on fire and that's um towing and repairs i guess at five five thousand six hundred yeah, and actually the, the more expensive one was the truck that slid off and was stuck on Reeves Road. Um, basically, with a full load of sand, it slid into a muddy, brooky area and, and tires kind of froze up. So that was a bulk of that 5,000, um, maybe three quarters of it. But uh, it was both. There was two trucks that went down for that storm, uh, and that's total for both, both vehicles. Okay. Um, Dave, this is Phil. On the same item, because that, that struck me as well, um, one of the trucks had that electrical fire, which, and it was brand new, and I, is it fair to assume that that was under warranty? Uh, <clears throat> no, it's not fair to assume. Um, I believe that uh, one of the connections from the battery had, had uh, I can't remember the specifics, but um, had kind of come down and was on the metal plate beneath the battery and somehow shorted and and um, it, so it's it's I'm not 
No, that's not a clear cut case of something that could not have been human or highway error on our part. Okay. Okay. Um, at, in North Heartland, at the school, Arch Tree Service. That's a big bill. At the tennis courts, $6,280. Yeah, so we've actually been talking about this for, I know we have, I don't know, maybe about a year and a half um, on that in the need to cut around the tennis courts. Yeah. So there was two fairly sizable ones be behind the basketball courts, actually, or behind one of the basketball courts and then behind the tennis court. And then there was numerous trees uh, alongside the width of the tennis courts. And uh, those all came down and it was cleared out. Um, I would also point out that uh, one of those trees limbs fell off and broke the fence uh, this fall. So we've had knocks on tap to do that work. I don't know, maybe since the beginning of uh, late spring of last year, um, if not the year before. Uh, and he was finally had an opening to do it and um, we got it done. Okay. And the last thing I've got is, for what period of time does the $26,000 cover our ambulance bill in the town of Windsor? Uh, you know, good question, but I believe that that is, um, uh, I'll go on out to get back to you specifically. Okay. okay. Uh, I can get back to you tomorrow on that. All right. All right, anybody else? Yeah, uh, Dave, this is Phil. Um, Gordon already asked most of my questions, but the one left for me is the payment to the Vermont um, League of Cities and Towns for the insurance package. Uh, it looks like it's a quarter one payment, and I'm just a little confused what the $90,000, is it per quarter that we're paying that for insurance? It's on page, on the last page, or oh, page five. No, page six. Yep. No, I, I believe that's for the year, actually. Um, policy period being January 1st, 2021 to January 1st, 2022. <clears throat> okay, I was confused by that 2109.90 Q1. But uh, let's just hope that it is the yearly payment. It's enough. Uh, it says back actually billing installment annual. So that, that's just an invoice number. You know, Q could just be a coincidence or. Gotcha. Well, okay. Martin weighed in and said it is for the whole year. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, chat. Somewhere. Anyone else? So we have a, a motion and a second, I believe. So all in favor? Bill Aye. Aye. Mary. Aye. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Now, I don't believe we need public comments, but something, I suppose there might be something somebody's got to say that's off subject here. It's pretty quiet. Okay, so what we're going to do um, is move right on to the uh, solar solar discussion with Norwich Solar, so that um, they can. Um, do other things if they don't want to stay and watch a debate if they want, but if they don't, they are free to go. <laughs> so, Troy, I guess uh, we're ready to listen to your presentation. Great, thank you, thank you, Gordon. Um, also on on this meeting is uh, Tom Kennedy uh, from the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste Management District. So I'm Troy McBride, 
of Norwich Solar and White River Junction. Um, we were recently selected to buy the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste Management District through a RFP process to work with them on a uh, solar project on their uh, property that's in the northeast corner of Heartland. So they own uh, over 100 acres uh, up just south of the Twin State uh, gravel facility that's right in the northeast uh, corner of Heartland. Uh, we're working with them on a potential 500 kilowatt community solar net metering project on um, three, approximately three acres of that uh, property. And uh, in your packet, you should see uh, some more information on that parcel and then this particular location that we're proposing on that on that parcel. So just as a little background, one of the first steps for a project like this is to present the project to the local planning commission, the local select board, and then the regional planning commission to confirm the sites appropriate for the solar project. So we met with the planning commission last week and uh, presented the project to the planning commission. Uh, the planning commission uh, reviewed the project and agreed to confirm that the project is appropriate for solar and authorize the chair to sign the preferred siting letter that is a, a template of which is in your in your packet. Um, so also in the packet is a little more information on the preferred siting process, uh, that template letter, and then the the uh, you know the site location and then a site uh, a zoom up of that. Uh, proposed uh, layout of solar on that on that uh, uh, property. Um, I can provide more information, but I'm happy to also take any questions that you might have on on this uh, project. We feel this is an excellent location. The Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste Management District has. Uh, twice before tried to uh, 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 do solar project, a larger solar project on this property, um, uh, including a, you know, a, a 5,000 kilowatt project with, uh, with gross solar. There were some issues with the, that big of a project uh, with Green Mountain Power. Um, and so this project uh, will uh, easily be able to go back on the lines there they've also uh yeah there's there's power that comes up to the site and uh it's uh they have the bridge that goes across the interstate to access the site and it's a nice co-location there with the uh near the uh near the twin state uh gravel facilities the location we're looking at is a is a field it's uh in the is indicated by a star in that exhibit A of the solar site general description. And in that uh, field is uh, surrounded on the four sides with trees. Uh, closest the field is in the winter, fleetingly visible from the interstate. So there are trees there, but you know, you'll be able to peek through on the interstate as you pass by, but it's, uh, uh, we believe an excellent location. And then exhibit B just shows as a, a more of a zoom up of the uh, of the uh, proposed facility. And Tom, I don't know if you uh, if there's anything you would like to add uh, add to that, but I'm uh, also so, interested in questions. So, uh, in 2013, the district. Uh, did a series of public meetings <clears throat> as far as what we could do with the land um, and the um, the outcome from that was that to develop a sustainability park that um, dealt with solid waste issues but also with solar and so this is part of the implementation of that plan that we did uh, um, we we started in 2013. Uh, Troy also mentioned that uh, we've tried in the past uh, 
to develop solar on the site. And one of the issues we had is we didn't have access to three phase power. Uh, about a year ago, Twin State had three three phase power uh, brought in to um, for 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 their operation there at the at the gravel pit. And um, it's my understanding there's been some um, upgrading to one of the substations that was problematic for us in the past. Uh, the, the solid waste district plans on paying taxes on this project. So just because we're a municipality and we're not going to be seeking any deferment of, of deferral for of taxes. And it's just as a note that, that the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste Management District will be receiving a lease payment from us for hosting the solar array, and then there is state and municipal taxes on the uh, on the solar project itself. And so that solar project will pay those uh, the the taxes on the solar uh, equipment uh, to to Heartland as well to the state education fund. Gordon, I have a question. Yes, Phil, go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, uh, actually going to ultimately be a question for two folks that are in the audience this evening. Um, as many of you know, the uh, Harlan Energy Committee with Two Rivers had spent months working on an enhanced energy plan. And in that, they had preferred sites. That plan was given to the Planning Commission, but the Planning Commission, I believe, has not yet embraced it. Um, I'm wondering if I could ask Carl and Sarah if, in fact, this area was one of the sites that was considered to be an improved site in Heartland's energy chapter of the town plan. Um, I, can, I will look that up right now. This was Sarah. Um, well, Sarah looks that up. Uh, I have a question. So the construction of this, how, how will the site be accessed? Will it be off of the, the offshoot of the um, Twin State Road or will it be through, the, through Mill Street all the way through the backwoods? So it'll be off the, uh, the Twin State uh gravel road which is called quarry road yeah and uh if you the site plan that we shared actually since that uh overhead photograph has been taken there's actually been a fair amount of work there by the greater upper valley solid weight management district there's a new uh composting facility in there uh, and there's both there's windrows on the field to the north and then there's more, uh, uh, there's an, a, a parking area and there's a modern um, uh, receiving facility and a processor for, uh, for uh, additional compost that uh, can contain uh, things that are you, you wouldn't typically compost in windrows like uh, your meat products and other products. Um, so it's, a, it's been upgraded and so then we would access, you know, through that, uh, through that area as well as bringing power yep. okay so one question i had and correct me if i'm wrong because for some reason my bl brain is blanking and i can't find it on the the satellite imagery right now but i believe the trask family cemetery is in between quarry road and the field that you're proposing constructing in right so yeah trask so one cemetery Oh, go ahead, Drew. So just one, yeah, uh, uh, just one note is this plan that you see here uh, on this this exhibit B has been changed slightly in terms of which way the power goes, and so uh, it actually goes straight across the uh, sort of the eastern edge of the open field there, and the and that's in part because. Uh, of both, there's a wet area and there is a uh, um, a cemetery in that uh, sort of northwest area. 
And so that uh, is a good point. And it's been the, the solar field exactly the same, but the direction of the power has changed slightly from this. And um, the town also received a 45 day notice. And on that, there's a slightly different map on that uh, than this one that I sent on December 12th. So I know that that cemetery has a little rise and then it's on the top of the rise off of the road there. Um, so have there, I, I guess all I could seek right now is assurances, but um, couldn't you provide assurances that the construction activity isn't going to negatively impact on the cemetery there? Yeah, I, absolutely. And we're, we'll be uh, nowhere near it, but uh, but Tom, can you just confirm what I said is correct? So um, we're well aware, and I'm also on the Heartland Cemetery Committee, so we cherish that cemetery. So we're actually going to be, oh, 300, 400 yards to the east of the cemetery. So we're actually oh. going to be way behind it. Uh, and then we're actually, and again, this hasn't been uh, decided for sure, but I believe what we're going to end up doing is actually bringing the power in on the back side of the site. It's so the power line is not going to be along the I-91 corridor. You're actually not you, you're not going to be able to see the power line from so, from the interstate. Cool. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah. So none of the none of the construction activities is actually going to rely on historic Mill Street. There, we are not. No. Uh, be, there would have to be a considerable amount of upgrading, and it's also a class four road. Yeah. So, we, you know, there's all different types of permissions. So we're actually thinking of accessing from the backside. Okay. I think I, I think I see what you're talking about. Um, another point is that the people who like to dump their illegally uh, poached carcasses on that southern field are going to be disappointed once that field disappears. So there are now three gates on that class four road. <laughs> Doesn't stop it. <laughs> Sarah, do you have the, the yeah. your findings? I, this is what I remember, but I'm sorry. I wanted to see it in front of me in, in writing. Um, under identification of preferred sites in Heartland, uh, the second item are the following specific sites in Heartland are preferred for development of renewable energy infrastructure. Infrastructure, excuse me. The first one listed, and tell me, I'm almost sure this is what you're talking about. The underdeveloped permitted landfill owner owned by GUV SWD near the Heartland Hartford border. Am I correct? Yes. Yes. So now, what Phil said is true. Uh, we submitted um, this plan. Um, about a year ago, and the Planning Commission has relatively recently indicated that they are editing it. Um, and so you're going to have to double check with them, but I actually don't think they would cut that section out. Um, I might be able, I wonder if I can find the edited one. I think we're okay, Sarah, because uh, not. they made a visit to the Planning Commission already. Yeah, it's just as a note, I didn't want to uh, say anything wrong, but the Planning Commission did say that this site was already listed as a preferred site uh, on the on the plan. However, since that plan hasn't been uh, approved yet, we would need the uh, the signed letter. Um, but they did confirm that it, it was already on the the not yet approved plan. Okay, um, I have a question for either of you guys. Uh, is this field being used by uh, anyone? Like yes. Meetings? Yeah, Meachams. So, so they're hanging it. But, okay. I wonder how they get there. They come up through, or they come, come over the covered bridges. Yeah. Gordon, this Mary, I have a question for Troy. Sure, go ahead. Um, Troy, what's the lifespan of these solar panels? Has it gotten any longer? 
Yeah, so the agreement with the Greater Upper Valley Solid Weight Management District is it's a 25 year lease agreement, which matches the warranty on the panels. And it has two five year extensions, <clears throat> which approximately matches the expected lifetime of 35 years. Oh, okay. Because so that's because it used to be they were, I thought the lifespan was 20 to 25 years. So that seems like maybe they're improved so that they do have a longer lifespan, or am I mistaken about that? Uh, I guess the, the 20 to 25 years is the typical time period of a lease. Uh, and so, uh, so th that is the typical time period of a lease, not necessarily okay. the lifespan of the panels. They're warranted uh, for 25 years, and they have been for uh, a number of years. That's a that's sort of a requirement of the tier one solar panel. There's a set of solar panels that require you to have certain things to be listed as tier one, including the the 25 year warranty. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I have another question. Um, I was quite uh, I was familiar with the other attempt to put solar on the project and that was going to be and mary i think you were in on this too we walked around in the woods uh, looking where the where it was going to be sited yeah and it was uh, i think it was all in the wooded area and i'm just wondering why why the different approach here so gordon uh, that proposal included this field as well oh, it, when oh, we looked did. at it for the yes it did okay. but uh, but it was um, at that point, I believe they were talking about 20 to 25 acres being involved. And this was just a small portion of it. this fields about what about four and a half acres, Troy, would you say roughly? You're muted. Yeah, so the solar is about three acres and uh, I would guess uh, that the the uh, the field itself is closer to five to six. I guess it says, yeah. Gordon, could I add something? This sure, is Sarah. Ahead, Sarah. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, uh, Troy, just uh, there were statements just said with regards to you're still going to need the letter because the energy plan that we submitted to the Planning Commission has not yet been approved. So what I looked up was the current energy chapter in the Heartland Town Plan. And I believe that is still in force until such time as they replace it. And still listed as preferred locations, three industrial areas in Heartland. And the same phrase that I said before with regards to the, own, the, the land owned by Greater Upper Valley solid waste. So I believe that is in force, at least what I'm looking at, the current energy plan in the current town plan. Okay, that's that's great. Uh, you I, see? <laughs> yeah, I would I would really a, a, appreciate uh, the letter as well, though it okay. may not be necessary, but I would like belt and suspenders. <laughs> and uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to also just you know, bring this in front of the select board so everybody knows what's, um, you know, what's what's going on. Um, but that that is good news. Uh, and uh, just for belt and suspenders, I would appreciate uh, also it being uh, the the letter being approved as well, or the signing of the letter. When when would you be building this? So the. The permit, the, the permit application uh, will go in at the end of the month, um, and it usually takes between six and 12 months to approve. Uh, you know, so the earliest we'd be constructing this is uh, sort of the fall, fall time period, and it, a lot just is out of our control on how long uh, the permit process takes. Uh, so uh, as early as this fall and as late as, you know, next next year. Okay. 
Any other questions from anyone? Right. There's something in the chat, Gordon. It's the south field. And Tom, is is the uh, fencing going to discourage trust uh, going to affect the class four road? No, it will not. It'll be below the class four road to the east of the class four road. Um, I might so just, just for clarity that those fences are put up with permission from the town because we would not be allowed to to block those. So it's more safety. Sarah? I, well, I just want to point out, perhaps everybody noticed it. Uh, Carl is on the call, but having uh, microphone problems. So he did post something in the chat. Um, I don't think it changes the conversation, but I wanted to make people recognize that it was there. Thank you. So, um, what do we need here? I can see we've got a, a letter. Someone has to sign. Do we, need that, we must need a motion here. Or if I may, um, Troy, I, I'm a little embarrassed, but are you involved on, is Nord Solar involved on the Eastman Road project? Yes, we are. Uh, could you provide a status of that project to us? Yeah, so that, uh, received its permit uh, just at the end of the year. And so um, we're just in the early phases of planning. Um, but, and then, uh, so as I was saying, it, we can't really determine when um, the permit will come out, but as soon as the permit comes out, then we uh, begin the planning for looking for um, uh, interested customers as well as uh, as scheduling um, and so that is scheduled for sometime this uh, spring or summer uh, for that project I have a question about that if we're on to that just for a second um, does the town get to weigh in on any of the details going forward on that on this project or the uh, Heartland uh -huh. No, on the, the uh, Eastman, Eastman Road one. Uh, you certainly can. The now that the permit is it, you like you're at a you're a stakeholder on all the permit proceedings, and so you receive all the the town receives all the application materials. Um, that time has passed, but you can certainly provide input to me directly. Uh, and again, on this heart, heart, on this project we're proposing, there'll be an application that the town will receive as a stakeholder and so that you have additional opportunities uh, to provide input through that but you can also also provide direct input to uh, uh, to Norwich Solar uh, or you know directly to the uh, be great okay thank you Um, Troy, would you be fine if in our motion we just designated one person, like, for instance, Mary, who already goes in to sign the warrants, to sign the letter? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, I, a typical motion would be to authorize uh, someone to sign the, the letter. Um, and I don't know, David, if, if you have the letter from Jay yet. Uh, he says he dropped it off. Um, I haven't seen it yet, so I'm I'm curious if he put it on letterhead. If he didn't, I'll need to put it on letterhead. But um, generally, it's um, generally it's the chair that comes in and signs that particular letter. Um, we can leave it. We can leave it on the back. We can leave it on the back table there. Um, you can nominate Mary if you want, but um, it's generally the chair that comes in and signs that particular letter. Um, chair of the Planning Commission and Chair of the Select Board. Uh, I'll just need to ensure myself early tomorrow morning that uh, what Jay signed was indeed on 
letterhead and you just didn't print out the letter that you sent. Um, so I'll take a look at that. And uh, if it's not on the letterhead, I will, um, I'll have uh, Gordon sign it and then I'll give it back to Jay to sign. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can do that. I mean, I'm like on Thursday, that would work. I can make a motion, Gordon, if we sure. are ready. I think we're ready. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we accept a lighter dated January 19th for the sole purpose of providing support for the, I need the name of the project, the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste Director Solar LLC project. Um, I'll second that. This is Mary. Any other discussion? You know what? I do have one question for you, Troy. Um, out of the, all the projects that are proposed, what would you say the percentage is that actually come to uh, completion? That's a tough question. Uh, I, uh, um, I I don't have a great answer to that. Uh, uh, but uh, um, in this particular case, like uh, I'd say, there's a very high probability because uh, we know that we know the Green Mountain Power map pretty well in this area this line can support the project and then we we know the the environmental studies has already been done by uh previously um uh and so we know the the environmental very well and so i feel this it would be a very high probability um okay. it's not not always the case but in this particular instance uh it is a very high probability great thank you yeah i guess i have one more question um you, you said that the power line that um, Twin State Sand and Gravel put up would easily handle this. Does that mean there's room for expansion if you wanted to um, make the solar field larger? Yeah, there, there, there might be potential for that. Like this one is no, is a, is a definite, and then we could do additional studies to look at uh, additional projects. Um, uh, so. Uh, it does appear the power line would be large enough to support more. The 500 is the limit for uh, yeah. this particular type of project, community solar net metering project. But there is the potential to do uh, more on that line, uh, most likely. OK, thank you. OK, so there are no more questions. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Still alive. Oh, no. Okay. Very good. Gordon, as part as part of that, was that also uh, part of that motion to um, nominate you to come in and sign it as well? Um, <laughs> it's okay with me. I don't know. You should no. uh, you should just make a secondary motion um, of the board to uh, allowing Gordon to come in and sign it as chair. Uh, I, I'll add to my motion. You can just, you, Phil, you can just do a quick secondary motion as well. If you, you've already passed the first one, so you can just do a quick second motion. Okay, make a motion that uh, Gordon Richardson, as chair of the board, represent the, the select board um, to sign the letter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Everybody good with that? Very decided. Yes. Mary, I. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll do it. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, thank Troy. You. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Troy. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> Have a great day. All right. So. So I guess it's 
we've got to move into this discussion about uh, how we're going to handle town meeting this year. That would be the next thing. So this has got to be, I mean, there's, there's a lot to this. There's been a lot of discussion last, last meeting. Um, some emails moving around and information coming to the board from Dave. So there's, there's been a lot, there's a lot to this, a lot to think about. Um, and there's also, I think, uh, some differences of opinion on which way we should go. So, but I'm going to let Dave uh, open this up uh, with his, uh, hopefully, Dave, you said uh, a quick intro into what's going on. <laughs> so I'm going to... Who has the mute button? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and make it quick. <clears throat> okay. So in, in preparation, so we've been talking about this for two meetings now, and in preparation of pending legislation that was signed by the governor this afternoon, um, I did speak uh, with the school board. I spoke with Nikki Buck and uh, David, um, uh, the superintendent uh, as well. And um, we, I, I posed the question to them uh, if this flexibility was provided to the town of Heartland, uh, would, the would the school be interested in moving along um, with uh, the town? And the answer I got um, from Nikki Buck and um, David Baker was that uh, that they would be interested in following the town in the town's decision, um, whether that be putting out a mailing uh, ballot to the public uh, or whether we were to move town meeting to another day, um, they were interested in following the town in, in both ways. Um, and, and Nikki Buck was invited and she is part of this meeting. Uh, she's here today. Uh, I will just put out a couple of things and in, in thoughts and concerns quickly, Gordon, um, on my end is um, if it is decided that March 2nd is not the date that we're going to hold town meeting. And I would I would convey to everybody that that statutory language for things that we need to put in place to make March 2nd meeting uh, happen is fast closing. Uh, we would need to get the flyer out um, to the public on February 1st uh, to be out 30 days before March 2nd, uh, which means that we would need to have the flyer to the um, printers by next Monday, a week from today, uh, which means that in the next article on the agenda happens to be the warrants um, uh, for the meeting. So depending on how this discussion goes, if we still wanted to incorporate a March 2nd meeting, we would need to, next step would be to approve the warnings for the meeting and that would need to go in the flyer for next Monday. Uh, and the town report would need to follow soon thereafter, going out um, probably the end of the week, the first week in February. So the time, uh, the deadline to continue on the regular town meeting, um, and it looks as though a regular town meeting on March 2nd would be next to impossible to hold inside. But if you were to hold an Australian ballot, um, we need to put those pieces into place, and that would that essentially needs to be decided this evening as to whether you're going to put town meeting off to a later point in time. Uh, so that's one of the first things I wanted to kind of put out there. And um, the tight line for the second, uh, the timeline for the second is pretty tight. Uh, if you were to put it off, uh, even though the school has expressed that putting that off is okay with them and actually gives them um, greater ability to digest the financial data coming from the state. Uh, they view that as a good thing. So putting that off for uh, a period in time uh, is viewed as uh, good by the school. 
However, both the school uh, and myself, uh, if we put that off too long and we back ourselves up too close to July 1st, um, I feel as though that becomes problematic uh, for two reasons. One, uh, if the school does not have a budget in place by July 1st, um, they need to live on, I believe, 87% of, of this year's budget, which means that they would need to make cuts in order to move forward or certainly make changes. Uh, in our case, from the town's perspective, uh, in July, we need to put together the tax rate. So we need to have uh, a budget number to put the tax rate together. If we don't have a tax rate, we can't send out the tax bill. Uh, and if we don't have a tax bill, we don't have the revenue that we need to do in, in September. And actually, the town has a pretty set um schedule voted on by the people at town meeting uh, as to when those tax bills go out so certainly uh the concern here is putting it off uh seems to be acceptable um from both uh, my point of view uh and the schools however how far or how deep in the schedule you put it off is a concern because we certainly want to make sure that we've got uh, an understanding going into July 1st that both the town and the school have a budget in place. Uh, the other things I will add is that uh, the second decision, so the timing that you need to, uh, whether we're going to have it March 2nd or whether you're going to put it off, uh, is a decision to make. The other decision to make is to have a, or try and have a live meeting at a later time, uh, or try and have an Australian ballot uh, at a later time. The school is already Australian ballot, so that decision is made. No matter what we need to do, we need to do an Australian ballot. Uh, the other decision is for the town and whether the town would hold uh, basically a town meeting or try and vote from the floor, which would need to be essentially outside. Uh, I think Brian may get into a little bit of this later on, but I will just point out that uh, there are state guidelines in place at the moment. Um, if you have an event, uh, you can gather upwards to 150 outside. However, the event, uh, you do need to socially distance and you also need to mask uh, in the state guidelines for an event outside at the moment is one person for every 100 square feet uh, or the facility needs to, you, you can fill 50% of the facility which means that if you have 125 people, you need to have a facility that can hold 250 people. You need to be able to, you can only fill 50% of the um, space. Uh, and again, you need to, to, to space and you need to continue to mask. Um, in speaking with Brian and uh, other members of the staff, um, it is our recommendation that um, you do have an Australian ballot we feel that this is um, a safe. We think it's certainly safer than trying to have a um, outside meeting uh, where you're gonna get um, possibly upwards to 100, 125 people. Uh, it is, uh, if the meeting is on March 20, uh, on March 2nd, we feel as though from a timing perspective and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, due to the close nature being uh, March 2nd. We don't feel as though we could put out uh, a, a mailer ballot for March 2nd meeting. Uh, therefore, uh, we would um, look favorably towards deferring town meeting past March 2nd uh, to a later date. Uh, we think that that is good because it would allow us to do a mail-in ballot. Uh, and we think that um, given a decision that uh, a, a concrete decision that we're going to do an Australian ballot gives us time to promote this to the public uh, and make it known that uh, we're going to have a mail-in ballot gives us a chance to educate the public uh, as to the date how a mail-in ballot would work where you can get it um, or how it's going to be mailed uh, it would give uh, Brian a chance to put out a mailer or um, allow us to communicate uh, via the listserv um, or other means, uh, the website or however else we can do it. Uh, so we think it's a safe and it's a predictable way and we need to do an Australian ballot 
regardless because we got to do one from the school. Therefore, we can consolidate it uh, rather than trying to do an event outside and holding an Australian ballot in Damon Hall. Uh, we got two events going on. We got a mixture of the public in two different places, opens things up um, from a virus pandemic point of view and to kind of come back to what we've been trying to do for the year, trying to be safe um, and methodical about things. One place, one system, um, and again, promoting the mail-in ballot, we think is the way to go. Uh, the last thing I'll say is um, that the problem that we see with an outside meeting is simply we don't have an answer uh, until later in the spring. So as to say you were to pick May 1st for a date, uh, you know, you're going to need to make a decision at some point. I suppose it would probably be as late as you can possibly go before you make the decision, which leaves Brian uh, and myself and even the school board members um, to the last minute to, um, you know, enter that information. You know, the information needs to be in the flyer, needs to be in the town report, needs to be in the warnings, which means we hold off on all of this. We essentially put it down and, and don't do anything with that until April 1st, pick it back up, put in that information and put it out uh, to the public. Um, so it doesn't allow us to put those pieces into place now. We're essentially going to wait uh, until a later point in time. However, uh, you also can't wait until April 1st to find yourself a tent or to put together the sound system or figure out the, the dynamics of how this is going to work. We need to plan it now. So we're essentially going to be planning two scenarios um, of which one is going to get jettisoned um, with a high probability that it still can't be done due to the where we're at with the virus. So um, again, I'm going to come back to the fact that making a decision and I'm going to urge you to make a decision tonight, uh, both on a date and uh, a form of voting uh, and allow us to concentrate on a particular um, type of voting. In this case, we hope it's Australian balloting. We can put that out to the public. Uh, we can focus on it. The public is not going to be in limbo. Um, the public will know tonight. They won't have to wait until April 1st to figure out what we're going to do. Uh, and we can put out a consistent message and move forward. So um, it wasn't short, Gordon, but um, it's the recap. It's kind of where the school is at. It's kind of where the staff is at. Um, and um, you know, it will need to be done. And, and this is what we see is uh, what I think is the most important uh, question of the night is what is uh, the safest and in, in the best interest of the public. Uh, and then what can we do effectively, efficiently and um, consistently so that the message is, is conveyed to the public and they know what we're going to do um, come town meeting. Gordon, it's yes, Bill. I just wonder how you want to shape the conversation. And as Dave just highlighted, it appears we have at least two topics, a discussion on the type of meeting we're going to have or how we're going to vote from the floor or from through Australian ballot. And then the second major issue is the timing and when. Uh, and maybe, you, maybe a third one is, do we make a vote tonight or not? Um, um, so, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to mix them all together. Um, Pretty sure we need some sort of a vote tonight um, so people know what they're doing. Um, a little information might be good um, before we get too into it. Um, I, uh, Dave, I have a question. I know that this uh, 1,100 square feet per person is, um, I mean, six by six is only 36 square feet. And if we have to double it, that doesn't equal 100. But uh, there, there's, a, there's an or in that sentence, Gordon. Oh, there is. So it, it's, a, it's a one or the other. Um, okay. And I think and that, how, uh, how long do you think that rule is going to last? I mean, that is pretty extreme. <clears throat> 
I don't expect it to change, even if uh, the vaccine holds, and even if things start to get better, uh, I'm not expecting to see a change in that. Um, I'd be shocked if um, we see one prior to Memorial Day, that's for sure. I don't think we saw a loosening of restrictions really, uh, maybe around Memorial Day, but as far as uh, events and things go like that, um, uh, they, they loosened it in July and August, and then they started to tighten it up a little bit in the fall. And I, I don't see that changing in the, in the, in the near term. Okay. And I so, think that that's, the, that's kind of the point I think we're trying to make is, is there's some real big unknowns out there. And, you know, the, the, the known, what we know today is that we're at 50%. You know, if you wait, um, you know, that some of the people that want town meeting, sure, I suppose it could go to 25%, but it could also go to, you know, the, 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 the variant strands that supposedly are out there could take hold and we could go to no outside events. Um, yeah. You know, it can go either way. Well, anyways, what I was getting at is a very big tent uh, for 125 people. Roughly, it's got to be 100 feet wide and 125 feet long. That that is a very big tent. Um, I I know Matt that you've got some information from Sarah's cousin, and uh, they were able to do it. A little bit smaller town, maybe not as many people coming, and an available space. So. But uh, I'm just a little bit concerned with even with the. Uh, uh, logistics of doing this. Are you are you interested in other opinions? Sure, definitely. <laughs> I, I just don't know what the right timing is for. Yeah. For comments. Well, um, I think we need a little bit more discussion before we head I'll in say. any particular direction. So, so mm -hmm. yes, the answer is yes, and we we are interested in other opinions. So, um, um, Gordon, uh, yes. one of the things that I think everyone's sort of like waiting on, hoping that the vaccine is going to come through and fix a lot of problems. I was reading on the Department of Health, um, their website the other day. They don't anticipate that they will be vaccinating people under the age of 60 until the middle of the spring. So they they're they're doing it in age age bands and so the first age band is above 70 then above 65 and then above 60 and they say they don't anticipate being done with that third age band until spring middle spring middle of spring now whenever that is okay gordon let me uh john bartholomew will put out a, a um uh, is in the chat he says, why do all the participants have to be within a tent? Why not spread out across the green? Valid point. It's kind of been discussed. I was actually kind of one of the first things when Gordon, when you asked me how this could be done, we could have something in, in, the, in the gazebo. Uh, the downfall to that is inclement weather, John. Um, if, uh, you know, we got something scheduled and again, you know, the dates are, you know, they're some discrepancy on what you can and can't do as far as changing dates. But, um, you know, you put a date on the warrant. Um, you've <laughs> also got the school vote being uh, Australian ballot. Uh, and then you've got, uh, you know, an outside venue or an outside event scheduled. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the day before the weather report calls for, for rain or, or for inclement weather, um, you're really kind of a little bit in a bind there. Um, I know that, and, and maybe Matt could answer this question too. I know that it's possible for the moderator to declare the meeting, uh, that, that the meeting has to be postponed um, for, could be just for a couple of days, but that it gets to be quite a problem to inform everybody. Um, but <coughs> if we were going to uh, wing this without a tent, um, that 
that would have to come into play, or it might have to come into play. What do you what do you say, Matt? No, no. So that look, uh, that that is uh, in fact the case, and the moderator can postpone. They can postpone for even longer than a couple of days. And my understanding is it has happened when there's been a snowstorm that's prevented people from being able to attend town meetings in other towns. I don't know if that's ever happened in, in Hartman, but um, because it does sometimes snow, Clyde, and March as well. Uh, so it's it is you're you're able to adjust uh, as as uh, as is deemed by by the moderator. Yeah. Gordon, I've got a question for Dave. Sure. Um, so, Dave, you if this was held on March second. You're saying we wouldn't have time to offer the mail-in ballot option. Is that right? Uh, in, in discussions with Brian uh, and, and Clyde sitting in on those discussions, uh, it, it's too tight to do the mail-in ballot for March 2nd. Uh, we can still hold an Australian ballot for March 2nd. We would need to rely on you know people calling in for an absentee ballot which is kind of how it works in, in any normal course of Australian ballot. We don't really have, a, you know, this is new to us. Uh, we generally don't do the mail out or mail in ballot. Uh, you know, they've kind of, in, in, you know, put this out with the virus. Um, so uh, that would be um, a limitation to having it on March 2nd. Uh, I think in the spirit of trying to have the safest event uh, you know, I think mail-in ballot um, it seems logical. Uh, however, we would need to provide the clerk's office with more time to put that together than what we've got presently uh, in order to make that work effectively. So how much time are we talking? So what, so what date would uh, the, that vote occur if we wanted to offer that uh, mail-in option are we talking april so i'm not sure uh how um brian can maybe answer as to how much time you think he would need i certainly suspect that um, april would be good for us um mid-april even i think at the at the very latest um i, I think april would be ideal uh, however, if you want to try and give it time to see what's going to happen, I think that the latest I would go would be the first week in May. I don't think I'd want to go any further into May. Um, so I think any time between April 1st and say the first Tuesday in May, which would be May 4th, um would seem logical so anywhere in that span and and brian if you think differently let me know but um i think between april 4th 1st and may 4th i think would seem logical yeah I, th I think that's totally safe um just given that i don't have any personal experience doing a mail-in ballot uh i can't really speak to a time frame that would be required um but I think the concern is that a decision hasn't been made yet, and so we haven't been able to really prepare uh, leading up to March 2nd. So if we wanted to do a mail-in ballot just to be safe and know that we have enough time to mail everything, prepare and mail everything, if we delay, I think we'd be in a more comfortable scenario. I don't know if, Clyde, if you want to um, mention any, any time frames, but I, I think it just, it, I don't think it's insurmountable to, to potentially do mail-in for March 2nd, but just given that we're, we're so close already, I think um, part of the reason why the legislation was passed and drafted was to allow towns that vote on the floor to delay so that it gives you ample time to prepare for something that you've never done before. I know that's something that Will Senning, the head of the elections division mentioned 
in an, a uh, town clerk round table that um, we've been participating in over the, uh, the past few months. He, he made it um, pretty clear that that the reason the the legislation was drafted was not so much to allow towns to delay to have something in person, but to allow towns to delay to prepare for mailing and ballots. Um, and and I don't know if people saw the governor's press release, but he strongly encouraged uh, municipalities to mail ballots to all uh, voters to ensure safety um, so that people don't have to make a choice of whether to play it safe um, or to you know risk themselves having to go to a town meeting in person. Do you have, Brown, do you have any idea how much this would cost the town? I know the state would pay for the envelopes, is that right? So uh, there has been monies that have been allocated to assist towns with mail-in ballots. So essentially everything will be covered. Um, so the envelopes, uh, the ballots, the postage, the return postage, everything can be covered. I will say, since we're talking about funding, um, there's not funding for tents and for doing an alternative uh, voting scenario. So you're certain about those uh, costs being paid because I, I thought what we were yes. told maybe a month ago was just the envelope. Right, because no, it hadn't passed yet, but but it did okay. pass, and uh, there's two million dollars that have been allocated to uh, help costs specifically for for mail-in ballots. Good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Dave, so, Brian, Clyde, question: um, If the if a budget fails, what's the rant? What's the lead time required for a revote? Believe uh, uh, I think that there's and Nikki can um, chime in. I believe that there is a set date that the school needs to revote. Uh, I just recently looked at the town language for Australian balloting, and I think it just states that um, it needs to be revoted by Australian ballot until it passes. So and I assume will, it's in a duly warned meeting, town, special town meeting, which takes a 30 day warning. Which period, takes a right? 30 day warning, correct. Yep. So then it would seem like, and, and someone else could chime in as well, but I think it would be prudent for us to, for us on behalf of the town and the school, um, to think about a time that would facilitate at least one or two uh revotes in case there are issues before july 1st so then we'd be looking at at least two months beforehand probably more realistically two months plus some time for printing and whatever if we're doing australian balloting oh we got a couple people with their hands up um besides you clyde is james i think he was up first james james that are elected, my term technically ends on March 2nd. If we're going to extend spring, how does that affect me? Okay, I believe, I believe um, um, Dave can answer Dave this, can but, answer I this but I believe that, that, uh, that everyone's, term, everyone's will term will be extended, extended until, until, their, until their, that we do have a meeting. Have a meeting, meeting. Or a Get a lot of echo on this. Is that right, Dave? Is that right? Uh, that's my understanding. I have to look into it a little bit more, James. But um, I believe that um, it does get extended um, until the vote can happen for town meeting day. So my understanding is um, is that the language that pertains to anything to town meeting essentially gets pushed with the town meeting. So for instance, the warnings, instead mm -hmm. of being off the March 2nd date, is off, would be off of the new date that we set. Uh, and I, I've kind of, based upon what I've heard in common sense, um, kind of putting those two together, uh, is that the, the, the voting for your position, James, happens at the new town meeting. 
so for the voting for your position happens on the date of the new town meeting so your term would run to that yeah dave i think it says explicitly in the language that the term for all municipal officers will be extended to the agreed upon the voted upon town meeting day okay quite Up. Well, there's several things that I guess if you if you postpone to a date, you know, and we're going to have Australian ballot, there's no problem with getting the ballots ready, the envelopes ready, uh, addressed and ready to go for mail to everybody. Or if you go with uh, by request only, which is kind of hard to do because some people may not be informed that they had to request one. Um, as far as postponing the meeting, I believe the moderator can entertain a motion from the citizens to postpone the meeting. And because we've done that, uh, oh, back in the, there was a large snowstorm many years ago on town meeting and we, we voted, the few that arrived at nine o'clock voted to postpone business until 1030 or whatever. So everybody showed up. But uh, I, I don't know, I think <clears throat> my own opinion is for public safety is to go with a straight Australian ballot to have a Zoom meeting to um, for informing the public or discussion of the budget and stuff. I know they can't amend it. But um, considering that there's some people at this meeting that if members of their family could have avoided the plague of the 1940s and 50s, they probably would have done it. Okay, thanks, Clyde. Matt? Uh, so speak, speaking as, as uh, Town moderator, and this is one of the few areas where I'm, uh, you know, encouraged to have uh, opinions on this kind of thing. Uh, I would strongly encourage the board to consider uh, maintaining the option of an in-person uh, town meeting uh, in the month of May. I've shared uh, that view. I think it's. I mean, I'm not. I haven't been shy about that, but I believe that the uh, the sanctity of town meeting is a real thing. Uh, it is a uh, institution and a process that is uh, has been uh, put at risk uh, in the past, uh, and I believe it is the healthiest form of democracy at a time when we really need to have uh, strong forms of democracy. Uh, the progress that is going to be made on uh, the uh, immunization uh, process, uh, uh, vaccination process, uh, excuse me, over the next. Uh, several months, I think, will be greatly accelerated, given what I understand coming out of Washington. Uh, and we don't necessarily know what the scenario will be come May in terms of the uh, risk profile uh, to folks uh, in, in uh, town. Uh, and having uh, talked to both the uh, town moderator of Hanover and Plainfield, uh, both of which are planning on going ahead with an in-person outdoor town meeting in the May time frame, uh, I don't think it is that big a lift uh, to ask our, uh, our, our friends uh, with tents, whether it's uh, Bloods Catering or others, uh, to be able to arrange for the kind of accommodation uh, that would allow for uh, a, uh, you know, within a tent uh, setup um, to be able to have uh, an in-person town meeting. Um, I'm happy to, uh, you know, volunteer in my role to help uh, wrangle uh, said folks uh, and uh, work with um, others who have in the past provided uh, sound systems for both outdoors and indoor, uh, you know, events uh, that have taken place in town. Uh, and I think that it is uh, fully understanding uh, the concerns and the, uh, you know, logistical challenges that Dave and, and, and Brian have articulated uh, that we can still uh, move forward with that, knowing that we're going to have to do what is normally um, the kinds of things that are 
done in uh, Australian ballot under our current rules, um, but still have an actual uh, in-person town meeting. I also believe that if we're in a situation where in the you know beginning of April uh, or even uh, a little bit beyond that, uh, the situation has not improved, you know, at the rate that we hoped, um, and that the kind of uh, expected conditions are ones where you would need a hundred by a hundred foot tent or or something like that. Uh, we could make a decision at that time. Uh, still have uh, ballots actually uh, post posted um, to be returned by uh, early June. Um, which would allow for time to set a tax rate, uh, set a budget, and move forward. Uh, I just think it is uh, a, a mistake at this particular moment to uh, to forego uh, an in-person town meeting, uh, especially. And you know, I, I'd be curious what the uh, legislation um, uh, or the folks who were involved in the legislation in Montpelier had in mind. But I, my understanding is it was to allow for flexibility for uh, town meetings to uh, uh, to actually go go on, assuming that it was safer, and to provide flexibility for uh, mailing ballots at a later date. So that's my two cents. I forwarded to, I think, most of the members of the select board the uh, feedback I got from, uh, from folks over in Plainfield. Um, the person who runs the town meeting uh, over there would be happy to chat about how they've set up those logistics, uh, and uh, same with uh, Hanover. Um, and I, I have not reached out to other uh, folks in uh, the Upper Valley on the Vermont side, but I, I would be surprised if all of them are planning on uh, canceling their town meeting and moving to uh, an Australian ballot. <laughs> hey, Gordon. Yes? Uh, I, I have zero philosophical points to make. I only have three. Um, sort of semi-pedantic points to make. One is uh, about prudency. Um, I don't, there are two things in Matt's statement that don't, to me, don't feel very prudent um, as decision makers. One is to believe that there will be some sort of uh, acceleration in vaccination schedules beyond what has been established by the governor and published on the State Department of Health website. Two, I don't think that it would be prudent for us to not allow a period of time for a revote on either of our budgets if one of them were to happen to fail. I think it's really important that we have that flexibility. Um, and then the third point. Um, is that the, the meetings in New Hampshire and the meetings in Vermont are fundamentally different meetings. Uh, the meetings in New Hampshire are guidance meetings um, that set the agenda for what gets voted on, if I understand them correctly. And that's different from the meetings in Vermont, which are uh, decision meetings where the actual um, policy of the town is set at those meetings. I, so I don't I think that's... Wrong. I, I don't. I don't think that's accurate. I think. I think it is, Matt. I, I think so. I. I mean, I, I had heard. I spoke with multiple people about the difference in these town meeting functions. So I could be wrong. Um, but. Well, if you look at the chat, Neil Allen weighed in and said that. Uh, uh, essentially, that you're correct, Curtis, and. Those are his words, not mine, because, you know, I don't like to say that to you too often. I know. And, <laughs> and, and secondly, he said something else about, oh, a Barnard is the only town, neighboring town that's putting off the meeting. The rest are doing Australian ballot. So um, I do want to weigh in here, um, Matt. I totally 100%, 200% agree with you about town meeting. It is a treasured form of basic democracy and, and we're blessed to have it. I don't, however, feel that um, that making decisions based on fear about what could happen is the best way to um, make a decision. So uh, perhaps we're, we're making our, we're thinking about this because town meeting might not happen 
next year because people will go with um, the mail-in Australian ballot thing. But um, I, I think pay, maybe we should have faith that more people believe in town meeting and will want to keep it. Mary, if that, if that, was, that wasn't my argument, um, if that was directed at me, I was saying that this is, this is a moment where having a town meeting democratic process, I think, is valuable. Uh, and uh, important to continue to exercise uh, to the extent that, you know, the guidance is allowing that to happen and providing us with the flexibility to do so, uh, I think it's important. And uh, if I learned something, Curtis, about a uh, town meeting in uh, New Hampshire today, then I'm fascinating, especially since they can do amendments on the floor and the decisions on the floor, like funding a library or not, which is voted on a town meeting is, uh, is as I understand it binding, but happy to check with same uh, extended family members on on that uh, or the town meeting uh, town moderator in uh, Hanover. Um, let's uh, get a couple more with the hands up. And Brian, we've heard from you a couple of times, so we'll just hold off a little bit. John Bartholomew, do you have something you'd like to share? Um, yeah, I, I want to echo what Matt said. I, I agree with him uh, almost 100%, and I won't uh, just repeat the same things he said. Um, but uh, other than the, the tradition of town meeting is so important, and I've lived in many places where the residents of the community pay absolutely no attention to um, local government. So it is so valuable to our town to to be able to do this. And in my feeling that we have so many unknowns going forward, we don't know what the risk is going to be. Um, there's certainly mechanisms we can, uh, in terms of doing stuff outside with the sound system, we can do this safely. And I would just encourage the select board to really wait until the last possible moment to abandon this tradition that I think is so important for our community. The point of the legislation, um, I was involved with that, obviously, and. Um, the, the whole point of the legislation was to provide each town with the option to vote, to decide, uh, to, to move forward in the way that best meets their needs. Thank you. Yeah. Um, OK, Stacy has her hand up also. Stacey, Lord, do you want can I ask a question of John and Matt? I just um, want to I just want to make sure we're all on the same page because mm -hmm. <laughs> they're they're making they, they both made philosophical arguments, which I, I think are great. That's there's a great space to have those arguments about the value of participatory democracy and all of these things. So I just want to make sure there's there's one thing that that we agree on, because maybe maybe we don't agree on this basic thing, in which case we're having really fundamentally different discussions. Does everyone agree that the safest possible way to vote on the things that would need to be voted on at town meeting is to do a delayed Australian ballot? Or is there disagreement on the relative safety of the options in front of us? So Curtis, I'll take that first. And my answer is I don't know yet until I know what the situation is in May. Right? So an outdoor, an outdoor uh, mechanism for being able to have a mass conversation uh, with a vaccination rate that is accelerated as the new administration has said they're going to put extraordinary resources behind accelerating uh, could be, you know, as I, I guess as uh, safe as a all mail in ballot. Um, I, I don't. It, it, the, the question is whether or not the trade-off of eliminating a participatory democracy uh, mechanism, which I do not see as philosophical, I see as a methodological way of actually participating uh, in a democracy. Uh, it's not just it's not just theory, it's actually how it functions in practice. Um, so I would, I would disagree with your premise on whether this is a philosophical debate versus a practical debate. Is there a uh, is there a slightly higher risk of people coming together if the you know if the uh, virus is not uh, altogether eliminated? Probably on a pure statistical basis, uh, whether or not that risk is uh, significantly high by that point is going to depend on 
how we structure it and uh, and the rate of vaccination at that point, uh, which, I mean, if, if you want to go down a road that way, the, the prospects of someone driving to a town meeting is more dangerous than people mailing in their ballots. But I don't, I don't think we want to go to that kind of a uh, extreme. So not to put too fine a point on it, but if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying under the best possible circumstances, mm -hmm. a outdoor in-person meeting could approach the safety of but, a mail-in Australia yeah. ballot. But, okay. I think that's, that's probably just, a safe way to say I, it. We, we don't, aside from putting that point on it, we don't need to make it too fine, I don't think. My answer would be, would be the same as Matt's, pretty much. I mean, with the new administration coming in, we don't know what the availability of vaccine will be. We don't know if Vermont's priority to get vaccine will change. We don't know if additional vaccines will be developed and approved and distributed. There are so many unknowns. It, we're in a holding pattern, and it just makes sense to me to hold off the decision as long as you can. Well, um, Brian, you want to put in your two cents worth here? I'll defer to some other people because, as you mentioned, I've I've already spoken, but um, <laughs> I, I'm okay. I'll chime in later. But I'd like to hear what other people have to say. Okay, Stacy. Hi. Um, sorry about that. I dropped out because they accidentally unplugged my router on my Wi-Fi here, but I'm back. Um, you know, one of the things to take in consideration is, you know, the cost, yeah, besides the cost of the tent, I I've done a little research. It looks like you're looking at about $4,000 for a tent big enough for people. Um, then you're going to have to rent chairs, um, rent your equipment, um, you've got Brian trying to man um, things in two places. Um, and, you know, you're asking some of your staff to step into a high risk um, or a higher risk uh, situation. Um, if nothing is really changed, which, yeah, we don't know. Um, so do you take what you know and go with it or do you hope for the best? I mean, you're going to ask Brian and David to be in the midst of 100 to 150 people. Um, you're going to have to take all the contact information for those people. You're going to have to make sure they're all wearing their masks. Who's going to, you know, handle all of that logistically? Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's fair to ask them when they've been doing all they can to maintain you know, distance and best practices and social distancing. Um, I know as an employee, a municipal employee, we've been asked to keep that in mind when we're dealing with our personal lives. Um, so to then say, okay, we're going to stick you in a group of 100 and 150 people you don't normally interact with. I mean, you know, that doesn't seem to me to be make the most sense especially 10 months into this thing knowing what we know um and knowing that yeah the the unknowns are we have a variant that seems to be more contagious um i've also been reading and listening to some of the scientists and doctors saying there's another variant that they're questioning um it may not make the uh where you may be able to get infected again easily um so, you know, I, I really think we should go with Australian ballot this year. And not because I don't think town meeting is important. I do think it is. But I think the safety of the residents and the municipal employees um, is more important. That's all I have to say. Um, Neil Allen, um, would you like to say something? Yeah, just um, real quick. Um, as far as new, I live in New Hampshire, so we have a meeting where we can vote what the budget's going to be, you know, what is on the ballot, and that sets the ballot. But then we all 
go and vote like we like everybody else does Australian ballot for the actual um, you know voting we do not do that kind of voting at town meeting town meeting is only to set the ballot not to vote on the ballot what what town do you live in Neil I live in Charlestown it may vary from town to town too it, I I've, I've covered all the towns up and down all of the little towns the similar size to when you get to the cities the cities do it differently but the towns almost all of them do it this way at least in this general area i've been reporting from Keene all the way up to you know cornish and whatnot and they all do it that way okay Gordon, Nikki Buck's had her hand up. I'm not sure if she intends to or not, but. I don't see her. Well, Nikki, are you there? I am here. You know, I don't know why. I, I don't see your. Uh... Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to, I just wanted to pipe in and um, thank David uh, for doing such an amazing job of um, explaining uh, what we've talked about from the school's position. So thank you, David. Um, so I didn't feel like I needed to pipe in earlier. Um, I, I just want to say that from the school's position, um, we just want to find the way to get the most people um, access to voting. And we felt that um, overlapping with the town was the most sensical in that we it, it would make the most sense to the voters that they um, traditionally do it all on one day. And so we wanted to keep with that tradition. Um, I will say that um, having to, to put off the idea of um, making an Australian ballot until June um, makes me completely freak out um, on the chance that um, if our budget doesn't pass, we have to um, reduce spending to 87% of where we are now. And that um, is like, I just absolutely horrific. Um, I can't, I can't imagine being in that position, especially considering that 25% of our budget is fixed um, and can't, we, we have no control over that portion of our budget. So um, being in that position would be absolutely devastating to the school. Um, and so I just want to pipe in and say that we need to make sure that we have enough time um, to have a revote on the chance that, um, that that budgets don't pass. So that's my point. Thank you. Gordon, can I ask a question of Nikki? Oh, there she is. Sure. <laughs> uh, hey, Nikki, thanks for thanks for joining. Um, I totally agree with you about needing to be able to revote. Uh, so we were talking about for town to revote, you need to have a duly warned special town meeting, which takes 30 days. Is that the same case for the school board? I wish I knew the answer to that, but I don't. I would have to default to other people. Um, but it seems like if that's the town's rules, I'm guessing that the school is pretty similar. Um, so I'm and, gonna go with that. And if somebody else knows the answer, please chime in. And um, my other question, like fingers crossed, the chance of the town, the school or town budget failing is zero. Uh, but let's say there's some non-zero chance of it failing. Do, in your opinion, is it, is it even more prudent to allow for more than one revote, or do you believe that one revote would be sufficient from the town, from the school side? Um. I have never, like, fingers crossed, and also thankful that the taxpayers in Heartland have supported us um, as far as I can remember. Um, I That's uncharted territory for me. Um, and so, I, at a minimum, I want to make sure that we have time for at least one revote. Having time for two revotes would make me feel a lot more comfortable. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's a world that I don't want to have to think about, but um, in reality, I guess the more, the better. And then the the final question about the the logistics of the revote, 
Um, Brian might be better suited to answer, but I'll, I'll pose it to you and, and you can hand it off if you need to. Um, what's, the, what's the lead time from a vote down to um, fully being able to go? Is it just the 30 days or is there additional time needed for mailers and printing of things and all of that? What, what does that look like? I'm going to default to Brian on that one. Um, and just to say that uh, from a school standpoint, we don't want to make Brian do it twice. So um, <laughs> that's, uh, and Brian can answer the rest of that. I don't have a firm answer on that, but I, I would assume that the 30 day window would be sufficient. Um, I, I think you would just need to warn the town. You would not need to have another informational meeting. Um, and then you would just need to adjust and print ballots. Uh, the one thing is if there is um, a need for a revote, if we choose mail-in initially, uh, we would then have to mail, it, mail ballots out again. Um, and likewise, if we chose to go Australian and we did not do mail-in but we did absentee request anyone that requested absentee on the first vote would we would then need to provide absentee for the second vote so would that add any time to the 30 days or no i don't believe so okay so uh feasibly we're looking if we wanted to do a revote we should leave 30 plus one days before july 1st when the budget would have to be approved by right if we were aiming for just one revote, yes. Cool. I just wanted to iron that out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Clyde, do you have something to add? Well, I think, and not having my statutes handy, that when you have a failed budget, you don't have that necessarily you can come back like in 15 days with a new proposed budget and it kicks in the, the cycle all over again. Um, now to scare Nikki a little bit, I can remember back several years ago when we voted three times on the school budget to get it passed. So, fun days those were, Clyde. <laughs> so, Clyde, can I clarify what you just said? It sounded like you said there needs to be a time to do a revised budget, and then after the revised budget is published, then or is prepared, then the warning takes place. Well, yeah, but you'd, you, I, I'm not 100% sure you have to wait a full 30 days before you call the ballot. If you, if they get right on it and bring in the proposed budget within the short time frame, we'd have to check the statutes to see how that works. But uh, it is a speeded up process for a revolt. Phil looks like he's annoyed at me being pedantic, so I'll shut up. Well, let's see. Phil, you had a, uh, some ideas about how to go about this. Uh, there's there's people that have been still waiting. I don't know if the hands are valid or not. And like Brian, I, I, I do have comments. Uh, if you would like, I'll, I'll well, say I think that, uh, they may, uh, like Neil and John, may have forgotten to undo their hand up and maybe they well, maybe they want it up. I'm not sure. Let so, it go away. <laughs> Okay, I I agree with all the reasons for an outdoor town meeting. Um, it, it would be keeping up tradition and history. Uh, it would be very democratic at a time when people are rioting in Washington. And uh, I think we're all craving social interaction. So I think all of those things could be met by um, an outdoor meeting. But I very much believe we cannot do that this year, that we need to move to an Australian ballot. Um, some of the reasons that I've been listening and thinking about is uh, I think we all can agree that the COVID-19 has been unpredictable as far as uh, how bad it is when it's coming back and so on and so forth. Um, I hope to have a vaccine, um, but it's still many weeks away. Um, 
and I'm troubled because I have encountered neighbors in town that don't want the vaccine. So it's going to be a little bit of a mix. So I'm voting that we have an Australian ballot and that we make a decision tonight. And as far as the date, any time between that first Tuesday in April and May 4th, I'll be I'll be happy with. And that would be where my votes would be. Thank you. And Phil, are you also advocating for the mail-in ballot? I, I'm not getting into any of the details of of that right now. And and I mean, I've spent a lot of time, like I'm sure many people did, looking at the bill, the Vermont League of City and Town site. Um, we're going to have our hands filled just with an informational meeting um, and getting all those things done. So I'm going to defer to Brian and Clyde about the you know uh, the details of the vote. I, I'm I, I'm really only commenting right now on the date and the form of the meeting form of the vote well the the um australian ballot is not as safe as if you have the australian ballot with the mail-in ballot like we did in november so again mary i i i'm, I'm not sure if you're asking me to make a commitment on that i, I i'm not i just want to keep it to what are we doing and when are we doing it right now okay just uh, let me inter just let me interject for a second so um in my opening so phil i think it's critical that we stick to those two decisions um it i, I did overlook the fact that the select board would need to um okay the use of of the mail-in ballots i think that that's it's actually part as part of the legislation that allows the select board to do that part of the flexibility so if you can determine whether you want uh, Australian or ballot or not, at some point in time, does you know, again, the two major decisions are the form of voting and um, the date. But uh, the, 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 you'll need to make a motion at some point as to whether to include mail-in balloting. Um, and um, again, that would be a component of the Australian balloting, which we would see as a safer way to go. Um, I think that I would say on, on a personal note, um, even, even if this board did decide to hold an in-person town meeting, I, I would have to say, given the conditions right now, I would not anticipate attending um, because I, I, just, I just don't think it would be a prudent decision for myself personally. Um, on the other hand, if it were an Australian ballot, um, I would be very happy to to mail in or drop off my ballot at town hall. Um, so I would like to echo what Phil said and just build off of what Mary said earlier in the meeting as well, is that we we I think there's a lot of space to see this decision as only applying to this year. And, and, and having trust in people in their desire to engage in this method of participatory democracy and be fully engaged in their local and municipal governments. I think there's a lot of space to have that faith. So I, I, would, like to, I would like to agree with Phil and say that I would advocate going for an Australian ballot and I would maybe take Phil's time frame and cut off a week at the top end and shoot for some time before the last week in April to allow for the potential of of two revotes if necessary. Though though if if Clyde's saying the statute is different, then that's totally fine for me as well. I just think it's important that in this time, especially given the different nature of the meeting, uh, we make a decision that allows us flexibility um, for for revotes on on budgets in case there are any issues. Uh, Brian or Clyde, do you still have your hands up? Yeah, I did, but now I think I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, no, I know what. It also involves the BCA voting 
to move. I think they would have to vote to move to a separate location for the in. Uh, unless the legislation said the, that the select board can override the BCA for setting a polling place, but it it would mean separating out, you know, having a polling place at Damon Hall, because you do have to have a polling place open, even if you have you mail ballots to everybody. Because as we found out last November, there are some people who are so skeptical of our system, because we're all crooks, uh, that they had to come and vote in person. But as it was, we cut down so there was uh, less than less than a quarter of the people that normally would, or uh, about a quarter of those that voted, uh, showed up at the hall. But you do you will have to run two polling places if you have a floor meeting plus the Australian uh, the Australian ballot. And I don't know what the difference is because. The way we do it now, by request, you still mail in your ballot. So when you say a mail-in ballot, you're, really what you're talking about is, shall we mail to all registered voters? And I, in talking with clerks the other day in an educational meeting I went to, there are some towns that are only going to mail to the active voters on the checklist, not the ones that have been challenged. And if they choose to vote, they would have to request or uh, come in. We have acquired enough postcards to mail out to let everybody know what we're going to do. If we're going to have the type of meeting we're going to have so they could be forewarned. Um, and those could be mailed out as soon as the decision is made. So that's it from the West End of Ta Heartland. <laughs> I'll uh, right. chime in. This is Brian. Um, I heard the phrase democratic process mentioned multiple times here this evening, and I'm not sure if people had a chance to uh, hear Governor Phil Scott's press release this morning when it was announced that the legislation was signed by him, uh, that is H48, I believe. But I just wanted to quote our governor um, as it relates to what we're discussing here. And, and he said, and I quote, although Vermonters value traditions like town meetings and voting in person, I strongly urge local officials to take advantage of the flexibility this law affords by mailing each registered voter a ballot for upcoming elections. Not only would it accomplish the primary objective of helping keep our friends, families, and neighbors safe, but it will also increase the access to the democratic process. Vermonters do not need to choose between their right to vote and risking attending a town meeting gathering during a pandemic. Our governor either even realizes that Australian ballot is the safest way to operate. I'm going to put myself in a little bit of a vulnerable spot here, but in nonviolent communication, we express our feelings and our needs. And I feel scared because if we try to postpone and have an in person meeting, I am putting myself at risk. I am putting all the justice of the pieces all the volunteers that make that election process happen at risk and we're putting all of the townspeople that would come out at risk and that really concerns me i feel really anxious about trying to do something in the first year as our clerk that we have never done that other towns in Vermont have never done and there's a lot of anxiety around the unknowns and I just I'm I'm experiencing and hearing 
all these other towns that have already made the decision to go Australian ballot that have it already in place and they get to stick to March 2nd and provide a safe election process and 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 here we are still debating what we're going to do i have a need to feel safe i have a need to feel confident i our our feelings might differ but our needs are universal we all need to feel safe we all need to feel confident that our elected officials are putting our best interest first our safety first we need to feel confident we have a right to feel confident that we're going to provide an election process that is safe and is secure and also sticks to our tradition if we try to move that we're, we're we're already tainting that tradition we should keep it at damon hall i think we all want to feel safe we all want to feel secure we all want to feel confident i ask that the heartland select board decide to go to australian ballot for 2021 and in 2022 we will revert back to on the floor meeting or voting I just I, I ask that we make this decision. So I've got a question, um, Brian. Are you also um, uh, asking for the mail-in voting too? Because I I said this asked this of Phil too. I think it's essential because to me Australian balloting is not the safest way to do it um so i think the safest would be the mail-in australian ballot you got to go in there right 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 yeah i would advocate that we mail to all active registered voters and we utilize the drop box that we now have in town and uh people as as I mentioned earlier, we have funding to pay not only for postage, but for return postage. So people could either put it in the mail or they could uh, use our Dropbox. And I think that's the safest way to, to go about things. So yes, I would, I would encourage the select board um, when we get to that point to make the decision to mail ballots to all registered voters. But you're saying we can't do this for March 2nd. I don't think it's a matter of can or can't. I think the time frame is very short and I, I don't I don't have experience to say we could or we couldn't, but I think um, preferably we would delay and that would give us ample time to prepare and to mail ballots to everyone uh, here in town. Um, I, maybe Clyde can speak on this, but I, I think Dave mentioned it earlier that we're just we're getting very very close to our deadlines and we still don't have all the information that we need to make a ballot so i think it it, it would just um it wouldn't necessarily be insurmountable but i don't think it would be in our best interests i don't even know if lhs could get us in um with enough time to to mail to all to all voters so so with that said, I would advocate that we choose to to delay and choose a date and go Australian ballot so that we can mail to all registered voters. Gordon, Gordon. there was a comment that I would like to read a uh, quote directly from it because I think it's really important uh, from Tim Gridley. Uh, he says, we, this household, would also not attend an in-person meeting Holding it in person would feel like a disenfranchisement of our votes. Who's to, who is this from? Is Tim a resident? Gridley. It's not someone I know. Is this Carlin mm -hmm. resident? Hi, if I could speak for a second, Gordon. Sure, we have met sure. at the last town meeting. I, but I think you were talking to a lot of people that day. Heartland resident. Okay, sorry. No worries. <laughs> So Mary, I'll just uh, 
pop in here for a second. <clears throat> I, I think part of the thought process, um, both on putting it off a little bit beyond March 2nd, and also opting not to do an outside town meeting and focusing on, on one decision is to be able to hone in on a message, uh, allow us to get, uh, uh, allow us to get the message to the people that look, this is when we're gonna vote. We're gonna mail ballots to you. Um, the ballots are gonna be coming. We're mailing them out this day. Just making sure that we kind of walk through the process with the public. Um, I think that not only, I think what I'm hearing from, from Brian is, is that, yeah, we can maybe possibly get, you know, the mail-in stuff together, but it's going to be kind of, you know, here you go, it's in the mail, this is what we're deciding to do, and um, it's just kind of, um, you know, I think it's just not as thought out and, 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 and organized and communicated to the public as well as we think it maybe could be. Um, and again, Brian points out, um, again, the warning needs to go to the flyer next Monday, which means that the next agenda item, you need to uh, adopt and accept the warning for March 2nd. If you decide to go with March 2nd, you still need to take that step, um, which is to approve the warning for the meeting. So um, I, I think that when Brian Clyde Nick, Nikki Buck and David Baker and I got together and we had this conversation. There was kind of a, a, a feeling that uh, if we were to put this off, it just puts us in a better position to promote that mail-in balloting um, process and also just to let people know how this is going to work and to put that safety message out there. Um, that's kind of what I took away from it. Sure. And, and yeah, and I'll, I'll add, Dave, if I may. Um, it would allow us to collaborate because we could do a shared informational meeting. We could make sure that we had one ballot so that we were voting for uh, town elected officials and the budget, um, you know, all the vote or the town voting as well as the school budget. It could be on the same ballot. Uh, it would be the same day. We could just coordinate a little better with the school. Um, and as Dave said, just really inform the town uh with as much advance notice as possible so it would just be um putting us in a really tight position if we were to still aim for march 2nd sure. but it's not insurmountable so okay if, um Gordon, i would like to add just quickly um okay we can't take lightly the informational meeting um I, that is uh going to be a, a, a challenge um I mean, it's not necessarily a hardware challenge. It may be a personal hardware challenge, uh, but I'm assuming we have to decide what software are we using? Um, will there be a moderator or, or not? Who's going to field the questions and, and handle the processing? And then we, I would say we would need to publish where people can see, find that information after the meeting itself. So there's a whole host of next wave questions that fall around that informational meeting much like they're talking about how are we going to do the mailings for uh, to, to the citizens uh, phil phil we have an elected moderator this uh, but the the, the this is all the readings i did uh, about this informational meeting are vague about whether there is a moderator or whether it's you gordon as chair um, um so um, I am I am absolutely convinced that Matt can do <laughs> a superior job. <laughs> uh, um, and my, I think, Phil, the, the tradition, even as uh, the school uh, budget, unfortunately, went to an Australian ballot, which I vehemently opposed at the time, as did I think many of us, um, that the town moderator does moderate the uh, informational meeting uh, for the uh, Four or five people who attack, um, but yeah, that, it's a tough. It is. A, I'd be happy to take it on as a uh, as as a, a piece of this. Uh, sure, and and uh, Matt, I'd love to have you. And I, I think Matt, you use the phrase "technology forward" when you're describing something. Uh, I I feel I'm in that same boat, but I'm I'm nervous about 
how many people may be trying to get on and and would need help to sort of join the meeting and where is that help going to come from so too much detail for this level of discussion or at this point but just to say there's more discussion at some point okay Gordon, so can i, I ask can i say something <laughs> okay um i've you know, sitting here fairly quietly listening to all of this and i find myself pretty much agreeing with what everything that everyone has said it's not hard to do but can't it's a case of can't have it all so um i think the um probably agreeing with brian um that safety for everyone's concern whether it be my my wife who tends to go down and count open ballots and count them and uh, but who and also who definitely agree with matt that we have to have an outdoor meeting or whatever it is regardless of what it costs you know but i i find it hard to quite agree with that so i <clears throat> i think safety for for everyone's concern is probably the bottom line here and in that light um i i'm in favor of making sure everybody gets the ballots in the mail uh, making sure that um, we have the meeting uh, at the at a sensible time, and I would not worry about having two revotes. That's a that's a far fetched thing that probably won't happen. Uh, so I would, you know, go for a a little bit further out, like uh, the, what Dave mentioned, the first Tuesday in May, as a, as a good date to pick, and. Uh, I hate, you know, I, I'm as passionate about town meeting as anyone is. I agree 100% with Matt about the importance of town meeting and with my wife. But, uh, and with Mary. And with Mary, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's a tough one to pull off. And Thanks, with, Curtis. Um, so, I'm, I'm kind of in, I mean, I'm with, and with the idea of we're going to have to not do it this year. Um, so Gordon, I've got a um, a motion teed up. If you want to take a motion, or uh, are you still? Yeah, Mary. I guess we haven't heard from Martha, so are, I'm. Oh, under good. Yeah. Oh, you're right. We haven't. Where is she? I uh, echo Gordon in that I've heard convincing arguments on both sides and it's a very very hard decision and i think i reluctantly will agree that australian ballot is probably the thing to do this year with the understanding that we hope that we can go back to regular town meeting in 2022. Um, Gordon, I had a question uh, for Mary. Mary, were you were you going to include a date? Do you answer? Yes, I okay. have a date, and I I'm just, just hold. I'm I'm just holding back on it so I can throw it out and it will startle everyone <laughs> and then stir more debate. Oh, so, is that what you want to do? Because then I won't ask the question I'm going to ask, and I'll just be quiet. Gordon, Gordon I just want to, I, I think we've hit on everybody that's been on the chat, um, although uh, Carl can, can Minster uh, put a, a message out on the chat that nobody got to. I just want to make sure that he's, he's recognized. Um, he had a question okay. here that says, with large events I've organized, we've often had no rain days because it's too difficult to reschedule two dozen vendors plus 500 attendees, and we accept the weather. In general, it works out okay, but sometimes much better than others. People will use umbrellas. I'd be much more concerned about the voting process. It is important to allow for a conversation besides the Australian ballot. So 
that's essentially his opinion and he's putting it out there as to um, his thoughts on outside town meeting. He's just got a question I think is more technical in nature. He says, how will you pass the mic? Uh, I would add that, um, and I don't know where John Bartholomew went, but uh, he has helped us with our sound system in the past. Um, we've used uh, Doug Linnell and, and other various people. Uh, we do have a pretty decent elaborate sound system. Um, it, it may be best utilized outside of inclement weather, but um, we have a sound system and the mic can be passed. I think John quite, um, you know, provided that, you know, it's not going to short circuit or anything. I think it can be passed around just like it was uh, a regular town meeting, provided that we have uh, an energy source to kind of help feed it. Could I uh, put in a word here? Sure. We had a the round table that Brian talked about <clears throat> that we went to the other day with the Secretary of State's office and the Clerks Association. They used the Zoom rather than Microsoft Team, and I believe there was a hundred people in attendance. Wasn't that Brian? I know we had, I know I had close to that many, you have to shift screens to get everybody up, but, uh, and, uh, you know, to recognize everybody, but uh, as you know, for informational meetings in the past, uh, most everybody knows, they think they know everything before the meeting starts, so they don't come, but um, if the, flyers out if the town reports are out early so that people have time to pick them up and digest the information uh, and you have a, 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 a platform that will take in a hundred or or more people because we were discussing it uh, at another meeting I was at um, you know the license from zoom is for so many but you can add for a particular meeting if you need to so, uh, I know it's a lot to pay attention to, but if people are civil, I think it would work. To, to chime in, uh, I, you know, if I'm to be asked to do this particular yeah. uh, process, I, I would much prefer to use Zoom as a platform than Microsoft Teams for a wide variety of reasons. But. That's a I prefer, and it's, and it's again, it goes to that check, checklist of what is the proper license that we need to have, and uh, you know, there's a lot of details that you know, Clive, you're you're hinting at the license piece. Um, yeah, no, I'm a Zoom fan too. Well, I don't think the license fee is prohibitive for the town of Heartland when you're talking to over a three million dollar budget. You know, if you yeah. spend five, yeah. if you had to spend five hundred for a license, it would be worth it. So, yeah. Guys, I don't, I don't, let, let me just inter need, let me just interrupt. We we've got access we've got access to both Zoom and and Microsoft Teams. Yeah. Um, CATV is more than willing to uh, help facilitate uh, an informational meeting. They do it for Hartford. Uh, Hartford's looking at doing a Zoom meeting for over five thousand people. So um, I, I think that these are details that we can hammer out. Um, I, I think that the most important thing is to kind of stay focused on um, the two to three questions I've posed to you guys and right. um, uh, move forward from there. Thank you. <laughs> Mary? Yes. Uh, if you're ready for a motion. I'm ready. Okay. We're okay. Ready. I'm just throwing this out. I expect people to wordsmith it to death, and I will not um, be uh, offended. So I make a motion that the town of Heartland adopt the Australian voting system on Tuesday, April 6, 2021 to take the place of in-person town meeting for 2021 only, comma, because of safety concerns due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll second it. 
Thank you, Phil. Okay, we need a little more discussion, obviously. Curtis? Uh, yeah, my question would be directed, um, the, it's just about a preference from the clerk's office um, that we can then talk about as a board. Is there any reason to prefer keeping it on Tuesday during a weekday versus going to a weekend, Brian, Clyde, Dave? If we're going to mail to all registered voters, I don't think the day really matters um, because people will have the option and opportunity to mail their ballot or to drop their ballot off. Okay. Um, regardless, you. regardless of what day we choose, we still have to have inverse in, uh, voting. But I, d I don't have a preference. Okay. Thank you. I, I suggest Tuesday just to keep a bit of tradition such as it is for the year. Yeah, well, I, well, I would Mary, take issue. Right. Martha, go ahead. Would you mind to um, whiz through that motion one more time? All right. I have to. I make a motion that the town of Heartland adopt the Australian voting system okay yeah I've yeah, got you okay on Tuesday April 6 2021 to take the place of in-person town meeting for 2021 only okay um yes gotcha. i can do it again you sure nope. i'm good okay. comma because of safety concerns due to the covid 19 pandemic thank you you're welcome thank you can i interject something uh Perhaps you should also include in there and that map ballots be mailed to all voters. Just so it's on on the record that we're going to do it. Called C A Y. C Y A, not C A Y, but C. -Y. All right, I'll have to wordsmith that. I gotta, I'll have to, because I had that in there originally, and then I took it out. Make a motion. I think uh, someone showed in the statute that the select board had to specify that. So. I okay. just uh, added it to the very end, uh, and that ballots be mailed to all voters. If that sounds okay. Bill saying registered. All voters are all registered voters. Voters. Well. That's one and the same, but it should say actually should say all active voters because we've got we've got a fair amount of dead wood out there that uh, people who've moved out of town that we we can't track down, but we can't drop them. But we wouldn't have to mail them a ballot necessarily. What defines an active voter? Someone who has voted within the last two general elections, or or we have proof they live in town. You know, you don't have to vote, but but there are people that uh, we got back a ton of postcards from the mailing the state did in for the for the August primary, and we got a lot of ballots back that they mailed out in November that uh, for the November election they got returned addressee unknown, no forwarding address. So we've got, but we can't. <clears throat> can't bump them until we prove they haven't voted for two general elections. So. I'm gone. I'd like to second Mary's motion. OK, so the, the motion that you have there uh, does not specify a date. Unless you've written it in, it, it, the last version did not mention a date. Yeah, it did. It's Tuesday, April sixth, twenty twenty-one. 
Yeah, that's what you said the first time around, but when you repeated it, you didn't you didn't repeat that. Well, no. I, I, I'd like to take issue with that anyways, because that's only uh, 32, three days beyond um, our regular town meeting time. And if we could add another, we could double that by going to May. I think that increases our odds of more people being vaccinated and and better weather when virus may go away more naturally. Uh, I think it's a wise thing to do to wait a little longer if it and I believe from all the conversation I've heard, there wouldn't be no problem uh, from the clerk's standpoint of making that work and it leaves time for a revote if that would be necessary. Mary? Well, um, you know, I, I'm not going to, um, you know, hold my ground on this or anything. I'm not wedded to this date. I just thought that, um, you know, come spring, people are outside, it started to, um, our attention is pulled in other directions where in March and April, you know, we're more focused on indoor things. So um, I defer to the rest of the board on that. Which, what date were you suggesting, Gordon? Uh, the first Tuesday in May, which is the 4th, I believe. I think my question about that would be today uh, if there is any any cost to having it out further it, in terms of like does it make it more difficult to accomplish things or distract from other priorities or anything like that uh, <clears throat> I think it distracts from you know obviously by may you know we want to be into construction season and and other things and and we're going to be stuck in on town meeting day um still kind of <clears throat> psychologically anyways uh into a degree you know administratively um i i i'm i, I put it out there that i'm good between april and, and may 4th i think that it 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 takes our focus from other priorities. Uh, I'm going to stick with the underlying concept here of being what we think is safest. So, um, you know, again, I'm comfortable with, you know, April 1st to May 4th, no later than May 4th. Um, and that goes from a from a concentration point of view as well. Okay, thank you. Um, let me let me say one more thing. I believe that uh, what we heard last about the vaccinations were, was that they are going to be mostly done with the uh, medical people and the people who are um, necessary. I don't know if for that includes store clerks or not, but and they would move on to people over 75 starting on the 25th of January. Well, that's when, when a person that age can call and try to make an appointment. So then before they are safe, they've got to have their second vaccination, which is also, uh, I don't remember how, maybe Dave knows how long that is. It's another uh, two, three weeks later. Uh, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, so by April, the Feb February, I mean, January 25th um, gives you a month. It just isn't isn't much of any extra time to get some of that done. And that's just for those over 75. Then we've got to move on to people probably over 65. And it would be nice if we could at least have the comfort that people over 65 had been vaccinated before we before we put them at risk counting votes down in Damon Hall, which someone has got to do. I think Clyde probably falls into that category. 
as I do. So, uh, and my wife, right. she's going to be down there. Well, if I put in here, uh, part of what we heard last week was that unless the tape that comes out of the tabulator shows that there were more write-in ballots than there were for any candidate for an office, that we wouldn't have to go through all the ballots like we do with the general election and stuff. Uh, they put that thing into the law. So uh, if we get a candidate for every office, which uh, there's a chance of having write-ins is a lot slimmer than uh, if you have a bank, as you know, if you have a blank office on the ballot, bingo, we've got to write in every Tom, Dick, and Harry in town that, well, wouldn't that be funny if we voted in for so-and-so? And I know last town meeting there was one office, we had 54 different people written in that not a one of them would <laughs> if they got enough votes to win. So that getting together, some people will have to be there just in case, you know, uh, on call, you might say, if the tail of the tape says we need them, but um, we may not need them. So, you know, we can have them ready to come. And if we, if they say at seven, when the tally tape comes out, there aren't enough write-in votes for any one office to uh, outdo, possibly outdo the candidate on the ballot. There's no need of uh, going through the ballot, going through and checking for write-ins. Okay, thank you, Clyde. Mary, Martha, who wants to speak? What? One, you're flashing, and as is Martha. Really? I, I don't know why. <laughs> okay, I don't know how that works. You're making some noise, I guess. That's an unfortunate uh, verb that you chose there, but we can move on. <laughs> I, I would like to say that I would agree with Gordon given that the emphasis, the decision has been made with an emphasis for safety and it falls within the time frame detailed by Dave as allowing us to not get too distracted and we don't think a second revote is remotely likely, then I would agree with Gordon on the, on the date he gave. If there's any fear of a second revote, there's maybe somewhere mid-April between uh, Mary and Gordon's dates might be okay, but um, yeah. Uh, I'll agree with Curtis as you would agree with me, and I don't have any changes to what he said. Okay. You good with that, Mary? Oh, Martha? You're muted, Mary. Mary's, thank you. I'm just one humble voice here, Gordon, in this yes, I'm, I'm protracted asking. discussion. So, <laughs> um, you know, whatever you want, what everybody wants, what, what do you want? Dave, you, Dave, you're fine with the um, March, May 4th thing, right? Uh, I'm, I'm good with that. I, that's acceptable to me. Okay. As long as it's not too scary for Nikki. I don't know if, if Nikki's yeah, around. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, that's fine by me. Good. Okay. Thank you. Well, can I amend the um, motion then? To Tuesday, uh, May 4th. I will second the amendment. So I guess 
technically we then vote on the motion and then vote on the amendment. I know. I think we can we can change the motion and Phil can re-second it. <laughs> well, whoever did it. Re-seconded it. I'll re-second it. Is that a verb? I actually was the first to second it. My uh, oh, so my. we can just amend. Excuse we can just me, put put a new date in the original motion. Is that what you're saying? I think so. And All right. Done. It's done, and you and then you can. Okay. So I think we're all right. We don't have a parliamentarian here. Oh, well, Clyde can tell us. <laughs> I think we're all right with the sec with the motion. And the yeah, if the if the original maker of the motion changes and the original seconder agrees, you don't have to go through the whole operation of adopting and amending. So okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. As long as they see eye to eye, they're in like Flint. Okay. Okay. We see our tie, don't we, Phil? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> okay. Is um, um, is there any other discussion that's needed at this moment, or we beat this pretty much to death here? I think. <laughs> so, all right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mary says aye. Phil, aye. I everyone says I okay thank you all so now Dave um, we've got two two warnings here to look at and I assume that we know which one to look at now you do but I'm going to ask that you uh, actually put that off uh, till the February because you've got to uh, fix it. Fix it a little meeting, bit. We need to me. we need to change the dates, and um, there's actually two or three of the um, of the appropriations. I just need to clean up. Um, yeah. We could have we could have done that if necessary tonight, but I think that um, you'll have a, a a better draft for February first. So I think that um, we'll put that off to next meeting, and you can adopt the warning uh, at the next town meeting. Uh, I'm sorry, next select, this meeting. select board meeting um, on Monday the 1st. Okay, very good. All right, so. so um, uh, Gordon, let me just back up. I just want to make okay. sure that all the all the board members um, are clear on the two that I gave you. Uh, one I gave you was for a live meeting. Um, the second copy was for Australian ballot. With the Australian ballot, we go, uh, the appropriations are voted on separately. Uh, we could, uh, on Australian ballot, put them, clump them together, but if one fails, they all fail. Um, so I think that, um, you know, separating them out, and if the public feels as though there's one or two that they don't want to fund, it doesn't, um, doesn't sink the entire appropriation. Um, selection there. Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. It's just officers and a budget um, in the appropriations uh, this year for the warning. Sorry, Matt, I, nothing overly extensive, but um, you know, that's what we've got. Okay. All right, so the next thing on the agenda is to take a look at the budget that we're currently in I guess, and uh, a little update. So this budget is to the end of December. Uh, halfway through the year, so we're at 50%. Um, it's starting to shape up a little bit more, become a little bit more concrete, although the story is still very much the same. Uh, the general fund, uh, if we back out the assessment, 
and uh, I do this each uh, discussion until we get to May or June. Uh, because we pay most of those assessments, I could probably do this with appropriations as well, but uh, I've pulled the assessments out of um, the numbers for now, uh, kind of giving a more direct view of what the operational um, situation is, operational expenses. Uh, we're just over 50 percent, um, rated about 51 percent, 52 percent, which is pretty, um, we're, we're pretty good. We're looking fairly good. There's nothing um, really sticking out uh, in this. Uh, I will note that one of the reasons why we're over the 50% um, threshold is that we have paid the uh, fleet and liability insurance. Um, it's kind of a hefty line item uh, across the board. So that's showing up as 100% uh, as paid. I will note that the IT services um, were over on the IT services. Uh, we do have licenses. Uh, I believe that all the department heads, um, excluding the library, uh, including uh, uh, Martin's department head. So everybody, um, all the department heads at this point have a Microsoft Teams uh, license to coincide with the uh, Microsoft package that we have. So there is an added monthly expense for the five uh, that we use. Um, we've also had um, a couple of people come in and um, uh, go out. Um, you know, we had Emma uh, along with um, Brian and Clyde in the clerk's office. So we had uh, three people utilizing an email address and had uh, access to Microsoft Office 365. Uh, there's a little bit of an expense there. Um, these weren't budgeted last year at this time. Uh, we didn't foresee it. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons that we're over on the on the IT services uh, line item. Uh, I will note that um, in both the clerk's office and the Lister's office, uh, where we had extra personnel to kind of see us through the transition, uh, in the Lister's office, we brought Cheyenne in. Um, Doug is now officially retired, uh, although he is still doing um, part-time kind of independent contract work for us. Uh, but we had uh, a period of maybe three months where certainly the hours were more than anticipated uh, and uh, we seem to be holding pretty steady uh, from a budget perspective on the Lister's office and we'll see a little bit of a decline actually in the hours um, used uh, because we're kind of back to Stacy being 40 uh, and Cheyenne being 20 and then um, Doug coming in about eight uh, a week, uh, which is back to what we had originally budgeted for. Mm -hmm. So we should kind of come back to normalcy on that, at least until town meeting day, um, or at least until the grand list, uh, we need to generate that. We'll probably bump back up a little bit, but um, all in all, I thought that we'd be higher in the Lister's office than we are. And um, we're, we're again, just 1% over. So we're looking pretty close. Uh, and the clerk's office is actually under budget. Uh, a little bit at this point in time. Uh, we did have Emma and uh, Brian and Clyde, and we're still under. Uh, we do have a vacation payout for Clyde, uh, although we're uh, a couple of weeks into that, uh, and we're still holding pretty steady, but uh, that I expect will bump the, the wages for the town clerk position um, a little bit above of what we had anticipated simply because of what we had to pay out um, for unused vacation time for Clyde. Um, otherwise, most everything is pretty well intact. I will point out uh, in the activity center, the taxes paid. Um, there should have been an adjustment here. It needs to come down to five or six thousand. I can't remember exactly. It's not a full ninety-five hundred. Um, that was uh, you did an errors and omissions um, at the your last meeting, December twenty-first. I think uh, that was part of that meeting where we adjusted. Uh, we were essentially overtaxed on that parcel, so uh, we shouldn't have been quite 9,500. 
Uh, that'll come down, um, but still more than when we budgeted, but certainly um, something worth highlighting and um, certainly kind of sticks out as you look through this. Uh, otherwise, everything's pretty well in line. So from a general fund perspective, uh, things are looking um, as they should. Uh, no real great surprises at the moment. Um, so that I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with the general fund at the moment. And um, we're moving forward pretty good. On the highway department, this has been ongoing since uh, July, August. Um, we are essentially over budget at this point in time, but this has been recurring now for four to five months. Uh, if we didn't have uh, the Clay Hill project um, or Martinsville, uh, or at this point, the Mace Hill culvert project, you'll see $128,000 um, expense in there. Uh, we did pay not excavating at this point. Uh, and the engineering is involved in that. Um, so you see certainly an over expense in the highway fund. Uh, the good news is, is that uh, on the Mace Hill culvert and on the Martinsville Road uh, culvert project, we are expecting grant offsets for that. We're expecting grant revenue. Uh, the paperwork for Martinsville Road was submitted right around Christmas time. And we submitted uh, paperwork to FEMA uh, for the Mace Hill culvert project. Uh, and uh, I, I jinxed myself. I was all ready to say that uh, I haven't heard back from Vermont Emergency Management yet. Um, so that's a good sign. Usually um, Vermont Emergency Management or FEMA, there's plenty of questions. Although, however, during the uh, town meeting debate, I did get an email from um, a Vermont Emergency Management uh, Coordinator, and they've got questions on the paperwork. So that'll continue, but hopefully we get reimbursement before the end of the year, and that kind of evens out the budget a bit in the highway department. If it wasn't for those, we'd be looking pretty strong in the highway department um, and in the, the general fund, but um, obviously we'll wait and um, watch for those grants to come back. And um, if they come back before the end of the fiscal year, that's great. Um, it'll be easy to follow and, and understand. Um, if not, we'll probably run a deficit this fiscal year, but the revenue will come in next fiscal year and um, it'll kind of offset each other over two fiscal years, um, so to speak. That's it. Thank you, Dave. Dave, uh, just a real quick question. Under capital improvements in the general fund, um, is the $20,000 budget, is that building up the capital re the reserve fund for the HVAC system? Or is that actually designated on page uh, four of the general fund? Under capital improvements? Uh, I've got capital improvements uh, on page six of the oh, expenses. Yeah. Uh, I'm, 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 okay, yes, page six. Uh, no, so the, the HVAC, uh, so we've got nine grand, I think, uh, for the HVAC system. The $20,000 was actually earmarked for painting. Uh, and um, we did painting. Um, just due to what was going on uh, and our ability to focus on putting that out to bid and, and having that done professionally, um, time got away from us. So we were able to do a fair amount of pretty darn good spot painting, I thought, uh, that Evan did. I uh, did the trim, uh, which was looking pretty shoddy, and um, we did all the spots that uh, we're in need of being done. Uh, the, the primary impetus for this was, um, if you recall, we, we did the roof two, three years ago. When we redid the roof, we pulled clapboard off in order to put the flashing underneath the clapboard. Um, Jansowitz and Sons was able to um, put the clapboard back on. However, uh, they basically primed in those places that 
uh, the nails were taken off or was close to the, to, the, to the flashing or was close to the trim. So we had some boards on there that were um, in need of certainly, you know, uh, an overcoat over the priming before we lost um, what the priming could do for us. And there was areas where the paint um, or stain, I'm not exactly sure what it is, was fading. Um, and we were able to do the trim and actually do a fair amount of that painting on the clapboard uh, with Evan. So I'm hoping to do more of the same next summer with Evan. Um, however, we did do uh, the work out at um, the North Heartland tennis courts. So you're gonna see an expense uh, pop up. You just saw that on the warrants. Uh, that'll pop up uh, at, you know, as soon as those are um, administered. Uh, so from an overall perspective, um, that'll bring us right up to about 55,000, 56,000. So that pretty well um, will cover what we've budgeted for capital improvements. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions for Dave? Um, Dave, so we've spent a lot of time today and last week and or last meeting and before that talking about things that the clerk's office is doing for us as a town. And I was kind of surprised to see <clears throat> that they ran so far below, were running so far below budget because I thought with Emma and Brian, it would be higher, but it makes sense now you're talking about the vacation payoff. I'm wondering, um, is Brian going to be getting an assistant? Uh, so Brian and I have spoken this to a pretty good degree and Brian can chime in if he wants. So uh, before I answer that, I, I would like to just um, remind everybody, uh, it's on the agenda that we need to appoint a town clerk um, and a town 911 person uh, the 9-1 person is going to end up being out of the Lister's office until we can establish that position. Uh, so Clyde will be officially retiring on January 28th. Um, Brian, you will need to, Brian will take um, the reins the following Monday, the 28th, I believe is a Friday. Uh, you will need to appoint him as town clerk on February 1st. Uh, so the plan was that Clyde and Brian are working together in the town clerk's office. Um, there is uh, a certain amount of obviously concentration and focus on town meeting through January. So I think that uh, certainly my recommendation was is let's focus on that and get through January. Uh, that's why we had Clyde uh, ask Clyde to stay on until the 28th uh, to see us through this. Um, and to add support to Brian. Normally, and again, putting it off to May, I don't think will hinder this, but once we get through the warnings and the town, may, you know, uh, the fire and, and some of this January chaos, we have a bit of a lull in February before town meeting actually happens. So, you know, when, when Brian comes in on that Monday, the 31st, uh, or thereabouts, get my days mixed up, but, um, he will, you know, the thought process is let's get through January. Then he can turn around and put out um, an advertisement for the assistant position. Cool. At the time it was okay, the assistant position would come in in and around town meeting day. Um, I think that that will still be, um, you know, the plan. March, around early March, by the time we get through, or at least Brian gets through interviews and such and brings somebody on. So if everything goes according to plan, the beginning of um, you know March, he hopefully has um, somebody who is um, in a position to do that. But that's been talked about, and um, this decision here may allow him to put that advertisement in, you know, a week to ten days earlier. Cool. Thanks. So is that it, Dave? For the budget, yes. Okay.
All right. Um, I guess then we're down to hearing the manager's notes. So given everything that we've just discussed, um, interestingly enough, I'm going to make a recommendation that kind of um, bums me out a little bit, but I don't see after giving this a fair amount of thought, I don't really see any, any other way to get through um, February here um, and what we need to do. So if you recall back in the beginning of uh, to mid-November, we cut our staff, we kind of split it in half. Uh, so presently, um, I am in the office. Um, and yes, Phil, I, I do sneak in after hours um, and work when the staff is not here or um, in emergency situations, I sneak in and, and don't mix with anybody. But uh, it's basically Michelle and I on Monday and Tuesdays uh, with Cheyenne. And then it is Clyde and Brian. Um, it used to be Emma on Monday and Tuesdays. It's kind of a key point. She's no longer with us. So we don't have the town clerk's office is not open right now Monday and Tuesdays. So it's just Michelle um, answering the phones upstairs and um, doing payroll and, and um, town report stuff. Wednesday, Thursday, Fridays, it is Clyde and Brian working together in Martin and uh, Stacy is downstairs. Uh, what we're going to see, it's basically started, but um, we're going to see an uptick in mail that we receive, uh, phone calls that we get, um, you know, items left in the drop box through um, the middle of February, even towards the end of February, because tax payments do trickle in well after tax day. Um, so based upon this setup, I, I don't see us operating effectively. I think that we're treading water at best right now. Uh, and it's going to be difficult to handle this load um, as much as we are going to try and get people to put it in the drop box or mail it. Uh, tax collections is just too sensitive and, uh, sensitive and an issue and we get a fair amount of people requesting information or just need to talk to somebody um, about that. Um, on both sides of the aisle there, the clerk's office and the finance office. So starting next Monday, I'm looking at bringing the staff back as a whole in Damon Hall um, and working for the week to get reestablished. And then Monday, February the 1st, uh, reopening to the public um, two at a time. Uh, and the person that is doing research in the clerk's office will count as a person. So it's going to be kind of thin in here as far as being able to get in. There may be a wait, but again, it'll be two people at a time. Um, and we will need to operate like this, um, I think, in, in my opinion, until uh through the end of february and um at that point i'd hate to kind of close down again and reopen so i think that we will you know given what we know today we'll probably maintain that staffing um but uh, that's the plan as i see it uh, i've given us a fair amount of thought um and have discussed it with the staff and i think that they're in agreement that we need to come back together in order to kind of work effectively particularly during the tax collection time Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, one thing I wanted to say was I I I think like you saw it with the schools, you saw it with all sorts of institutions. There was this holiday spike. We saw it with our staff. Um, so having the staff be on split shifts like that um, during that time was a smart thing to do. And being sort of past that spikiness, not that we're past any of all of the badness, but past the spikiness, I think, makes this feel less dangerous to me. Um, I, I wonder, uh, given the argument that you've presented for it, and not to, not to put her on the chopping block or anything, but are, are there people like, for instance, Stacy, that could maintain their schedule just to keep the density down, or do you think that's not a, a useful strategy? Um. So 
I am okay with, I've actually been, Cheyenne comes in Monday, Tuesdays, and Stacy has recently come in with Doug being away. Um, the state guidelines is that um, if you can work from home, then, then work from home. Uh, I would maintain um, being okay with that with the listers, although I think that it's also, they run into difficulties um, doing things from home at some point and still need to come in. Uh, what I didn't mention in this process is that the Lister's office still under this scenario, we have a town, uh, I'm sorry, we have a staff meeting tomorrow morning and we can talk more about this uh, with Stacy. But the idea is that uh, even though you can get two upstairs and you can access the clerk's office and finance office, that downstairs with the Lister's office would still be essentially, you know, if you really need to make a meeting, call us and we'll set up an appointment. Uh, at this point, a lot can be done online with the listers, um, or they can get the information and, you know, send it to you electronically or by mail. So I think that that effort will continue to do what we can do without bringing people in needlessly. Um, I think it's more, in this case, the finance office and the clerk's office without Emma and now Clyde's going away, leaving just Brian. Yeah. Uh, and, um, the, you know, the, the, the attention that the people will need with tax bills um, in, the, in the finance office. Okay, thanks. Um, outside of that, uh, I mentioned... Um, uh, the, the two projects in the highway department uh, where the grant reimbursement project has been submitted. Um, I have an envelope next to me, which I believe is, I'm almost hesitant to say this, but I believe is the official paperwork coming back to me on Forkbrook Road. So 24, 21 Forkbrook Road was closed on uh, last, at the end of last week. I believe that that went through as planned. Um, so that is an item that we can take off the priority list, um, thankfully, and uh, kind of move on from that. Uh, and Heartland Winter Trails, um, I have gotten an, a, a draft agreement from Robert Mamby. Uh, there's been discussion back and forth with myself and Rob, uh, as well as VLCT on that. Um, I think after today's discussion uh, between the three of us, I think Rob is moving towards a final um, addition on that. Um, so that will be something that we'll send off to, um, hopefully by the end of the week, off to uh, Able Waste. And he may or may not have comments um, with him. Um, he may or may not have comments. Um, so additional edits may still need to be made. But uh, we're kind of nearing an end on that as well. Was there a make it snow clause inserted in there? <laughs> there was. Uh, um, there was not. There was a little asterisk for the thank you for not quite snowing as hard as it should <laughs> so that this agreement can get done. There was kind of that little asterisk there. But um, um, yeah, we kind of lucked out in that um, process, but certainly for skiers, um, I think we'd rather have the snow. And we need that agreement. So I guess that's it, Dave. That's it. That's all I got. Okay. Okay, does anybody else have anything? Any nope. questions, concerns? Mm -mm. Uh, thanks to the road crew for making these giant snowballs. Uh, that they got, you know, just with the, the funkiness of this weekend's weather, it was pretty amazing and, and the roads were good. So thank, kudos to them. Yeah, we weren't sure what we were going to get. It was kind of a crapshoot there. Um, 
could have been worse. Thankfully, it wasn't. So, yeah, I'll pass that along to him. Thank you. Okay. Well, I guess. Oh, wait a minute. No! <laughs> oh, no! What? So, the public should know <laughs> that for the town report, we usually do a picture of the select board. Uh oh. So I need Martha to say something so I can get a picture of the five of you via Teams. No. And this I am going to try and take a picture. This needs then a we're birthday done. morning, Dave. Then we're done. You know, I almost forgot. You can go ahead and forget, and we'll do it <laughs> next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no rush now. <laughs> oh, but part of the part of the argument is that we can keep moving forward with this stuff so it doesn't sit and add up at the end. Oh, hold on. Coming on three hours, and here we go. Yeah. Kind of reminds me when I was little, waiting for my mother to take a picture. It's like she would could never take the picture. Right. Right. And she takes like seven of them. You Hold should on. have it uh, earlier when we were perky. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> smile. Come on, say cheese. Cheese. All right, I'll take one more. Cheese. Good. Yes. <laughs> God <laughs> knows what that's going to look like. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'll keep quiet about the <laughs> photos. <laughs> Okay, now you guys are done. Okay. Let's have a motion to adjourn. <laughs> so moved. Okay. Amen. Seconded. Yeah. All in favor. Aye. 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 Bye bye. And bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. See you guys. Thanks. Have a good evening. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Good meeting.